Jesus is the answer for the world today. There's none other. Jesus is the one. Father God, hear us in Jesus' name we come. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for another privilege to come before you. Lord, we honor you, Father God, as God, the God who keeps us, the God who blesses us. Lord, we honor you, Father God, for you are holy and we aren't holy. We thank you, Father, for another chance to hear from you. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, mold and shape our lives. Bless us, Father God, as we hear your word. We will be obedient to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Yes, he is. Our lesson tonight will be coming from uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Amen? That's where we are now. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30 is where we are. We have walked through this entire chapter. As of tonight, we'll be finished with this chapter. But I'm sure you picked up some nuggets along the way. You have your notes out, and we're going to interchange some, some nuggets on tonight as we finish up this chapter. Amen? Crickets. Amen. Crickets, crickets. My Lord. So we're going to finish it up tonight and we're going we're gonna to review some nuggets that we picked up along the way. Tell me about the first pericope that we addressed in uh, Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 is where we were. Who have some nuggets from verses 1 through 8? Verses 1 through 8. Anybody? Even if you left your notes at home, you ought to have it in your heart. Amen? Amen. Anybody got any nuggets from verses 1 through 8? You ought to be able to glance down and say, Oh, yeah, Paul is writing. Timothy is his, is his associate. He's writing to the saints. He's writing to the church of Philippi. And Paul is in the Romans jail. You know that right off, right? What else do you know? He's thankful for them. He's thankful for who? The church at Philippi. The church at Philippi. He writes to the to the overseers. He, he writes to the deacons, right? Why does he write to the overseers, the deacons, and then the saints? How, why, why does he divide these three up? Why is that necessary to have a division? He writes to the overseers. He writes to the deacons. He writes to the saints. The church members, the saints. The overseer. Is the what? Is the pastor, okay. So the overseer is the, the angel of the house, as we say it, or the pastor. Who's, who are the deacons? Deacons are the servants, right? They are the ones who serve. Why didn't he write to the choir leader, the choir director, the minister of music, and the usher board leader? Because they're not officers, right? There are two officers in the church. What are those two? The pastor and the, and the deacons, right? So he writes to, to them and then he writes to the saints. He thanked God for them. He's thankful for them. He, he's glad that they are who they are. Matter of fact, he's glad that he, they supported him in ministry. How did they support him in ministry? By money. They sent him money. They, they secured him. Uh, so they sent him money. And also, they supported him as he went about preaching the gospel. He, they supported him. You know, it's always a good thing for a preacher to look out in the audience when he goes somewhere and see somebody he knows. I'm so glad that I'm not taking a walk when I go somewhere. I'm glad that you, you all just so happen to be there. I'm just so glad. I thank God for the new beginning church. Because when I go, you go. Isn't that something? That's amazing. It's awesome. It's a terrible thing to go somewhere to preach and there's nobody there that recognizes you and you don't recognize anyone. It's always a good thing to go, but it's always a good thing to look out and see somebody who, who you know and who knows you. What else is pointed out in verses 1 through 8 of Philippians chapter, chapter 1? Philippians chapter 1. He thanks God for them. 
He, he thanked God for them in such a way that he reminds them that the good work that God has begun in you, he will, he will keep that good work up. Whatever God has put in you, he's going to keep it up, right? Right? So God has put a great work in you. God has placed ministry in all of us. If you're saved, the problem is a lot of churches place people in leadership and in ministry that are not saved. That's when you got a problem. You have a problem like never having a problem. And you don't have a problem on your job like you have at church with an unsaved person in leadership. Woo, good God Almighty. When you have an unsaved person in leadership, you got a problem. You, you sure enough have a problem. Why is that? Why is that such a problem? When you have an a unsaved person in leadership. They don't know how to conduct themselves if they're unsaved. What's well, another problem? How, why do you have problems? They're not, they're not going to be agreeable with you with the word of God. They're not going to agree with anything when it comes to the word of God. They're going to cause confusion. They're going to cause confusion. You know that sometimes the saints act like they're unsaved too? You believe that? Sometimes the saints of God act like they're unsaved. And I'm not going to call any names. Because oh. I don't know any of the New Beginning Church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because I like the answer. So God has begun a good work in us, and he will continue that work in us. Paul says another thing. Now, I, you're supposed to be telling me nuggets, but I'm telling you. Another thing that Paul says is that y'all got my heart. That means he said, boy, y'all put it at my heart straight now. Y'all got my heart. He says that you all have been on one accord when it comes to God. You've been on one accord when it comes to me. You've been on one accord when it comes to the word. You've been on one accord when it comes to dealing with each other. And for that reason, my heart goes out to you. You are in my heart. Do you know that you're in my heart? Do you know that I think about you and I thank God for you? I just thank God for the members of the New Beginning Church. You're in my heart. You in my heart, even in chains and in freedom. You in my heart when I'm defending the gospel and when I'm just, just lounging around. You in my heart. Paul says, You in my heart. Verses 9 through 11. What are we talking about here? Verses 9 through 11. Paul says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. I'm praying that your love will keep on generating love. Sometimes people start generating love and all of a sudden, they burn out. They're doing this anymore. Can't keep on loving for them now. Can't just keep on loving. Spouses get together and they walk down the aisle. They spend a lot of money. They invite all these folk. People come from miles and miles, fly. Then all of a sudden, love just burns out. And you hear telling them, no longer together. What happened to the love? Somebody said, love ain't got nothing to do with it. When you start mistreating me, love ain't got nothing. See, love will get you married, but commitment will keep you married. Are you with me? So, so he, he says, I'm praying that this love keep on abounding in you and, and that you will have a discerning spirit and that you will prove the excellency of Jesus Christ without offense. Then he says that all we do, we ought to do it to the glory and the praise of God. Verses 12 through verse 18, what did he say? Y'all gonna give me any nuggets tonight? And this where he was torn between living and dying. Is that in, is in there? Is it? He's torn between living and dying. He's torn between living and dying. How many people in the room torn between living and dying? Are you ahead of us? Or you see it in that verse? Verses 12 through 18 is where we are. In 12, he says, the things that happened to him 
or for the furtherance of the gospel. Okay. The key here is whatever has happened to Paul and all this stuff that has happened to him is for the furtherance of the gospel. He's been beat. He's been shipwrecked. He's been, he's been running. And all of these things have come together to further the gospel. So in your suffering, your suffering ought to be to further the gospel. And he says in verse 17, for the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Okay, so he's appointed for the defense of the gospel. And let me tell you, if you're appointed for the defense of the gospel, just because it gets hard doesn't mean you, you ought to be disappointed or unappointed. If you... It's like a woman that goes about the day and gets married to this guy, and one morning she wakes up and says, the Lord told me I married the wrong man. <laughs> God honors your choice, right? He gives guidelines by which you ought to be yoked up with somebody, but he honors your choice. That's the choice you made. Live with it. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you with. Y'all remember that song? Y'all yeah. don't remember that song. Huh? Oh heard the saying. You can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I know five, six people in here that heard that song. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my brother told his wife that God said he should divorce her, but he was your witness. Oh, okay. That's why. Maybe he should. <laughs> so, we have to look at the fact that if we are called for the defense of the gospel, we are called for the defense of the gospel. And in this gospel ministry, there will be hardships. There will be hard times. There will be things that you don't want to deal with in this ministry. I said to a preacher, you don't just quit because they don't agree with you. You ain't, you ain't been, been there a year and a half yet. How you gonna quit? Trick of the end. Well, the people don't. Well, you didn't get called by the people. You got called by God. Mm -hmm. Because if you just went and you wasn't sent, you right. quit. And a lot of men just went. But when you're called, when you're anointed, when when God Himself has called you and sent you, you will never quit. You may change residence, you may, you may change addresses, you may change congregations, you may change how you do things, but you don't just quit. We call for the defense of the gospel. We may change occupations. We may change a position in ministry, but God has called us to defend the gospel. If I was not the pastor of the New Beginning Church, I am still called to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do it whether I'm in the pastoral ship or not. I'm going to do that. I'm called to defend the gospel. If I'm in the grocery store with a baseball cap on, I'm called to defend the gospel. With my jogging pants on, I'm called to defend the gospel. And you are too. Verses uh, 12, no, verses 19 through 26. That's last week, right? Give me some nuggets. Verses 19 through 26. Well, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that what? That's verse 21, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Paul begins this particular pericope by talking about deliverance through our prayer and the spirit of Jesus Christ. Then he hits verse 21. He says, and King James says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What does it say in New King James? Okay, so it says the same thing. For to, for to me to live, listen to my words, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is saying here, that in order for me to really have real life, I must be in Christ. Other than walking in Christ, I'm just existing. I'm just living. For me to live is Christ. 
And if I just have to show up dead, that's gang. What do you mean when he said that it's gang? What is he saying? If I just if I just show up dead. going to be with God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Does that mean with everybody? Yes. Okay, listen to my question. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Is that for everybody? No. Explain. Those who are saved. Those who are saved, to be absent from the body, to be dead to this life as we know it, is to be present with the Lord if you're born again, if you're one of the saints, as he calls you. So, so Paul says, I really live in Christ. I really die in gain. What Paul says, and you'll see this on the pericope that we will follow through tonight, Paul is saying, if I live, I'm going to live for Christ. If I die, I'm going to die in Christ. If I suffer, I'm going to suffer in Christ. So I got it made. Once I'm saved, I really got it made. If I live, I'm going to suffer for the sake of Christ. I'm going to be in Christ. I'm going to walk in Christ. I'm going to trust in Christ. If I die, I'm going to die in Christ. I'm going to be with the Lord. And I, I will be transformed. I will have a glorified body. I will trust in the Lord. Confidence of this. I know I shall remain <coughs> and continue with you all for, you, for your progress and joy of faith. Okay, so Paul, Paul has, has said to us that I'm confident that I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to being with you. I'm confident that I'll see you again. But in my and, and he's gonna cover that in this pericope we're gonna look at tonight also. And if I don't be with you, I want you to walk with the Lord. I want you to be with the Lord. So he, he has the confidence that he's going to get with them again, right? But the bottom line is, if I die, I'm all right with it. Because you're going you're gonna to support me until I die, and when I die, God is going to bless me. Anybody in the room that know they're going to be blessed when they die? Anybody? Okay. Yes. Just one, two? So when we die, when we get out of here, we ought to be blessed of the Lord. If we're saved, we will be. Anything else you see in that particular part of Pericope verses, uh, verses 19 through 26? Paul says, I am hard pressed between two, having the desire to depart and, and be with the Lord, and I have a desire to be with you. He says, it would be a benefit for you if I stay here. Let me tell you, New Beginning, and it really would be a benefit if I stay here. Whether you think so or not, it, it would be a benefit to you if I stay here. <laughs> it really would be a benefit to you if I stay here. Get that, get that, get that in your head. If the pastor stays here, it would be a benefit to the church. If the overseer is around, it would be a great benefit to the Lord. It would be a great benefit. Yeah. It would be a benefit. When the shepherd, the flock goes astray. When the shepherd is ab absent, then the flock goes astray. People just kind of wander around. When there's no shepherd, the sheep just kind of wander around. They don't know what to do. Good thing about New Beginning, they put them in and bring them out so quick, they were never without a shepherd. <laughs> they just rotate them out. Are you with me? So we agreed on last week that when anybody passed away, that's a problem for anybody, especially their families. But when the pastor passes away, it devastates the whole church. Right, Ashley? Devastation. Don't get any ideas. It ain't going nowhere anytime soon. I'm not leaving here anytime soon. So don't get any ideas. Don't start shouting and jumping and praising the Lord now, talking, oh, we can get who we want to now. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, let's look at uh, uh, first uh, Philip, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30 for tonight. 
Paul talks about conduct. This word conduct is conversation. Is he talking about your conversation, though, when he uses the word conversation? In some translation, they use the word conversation. We're in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. In verse 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the gospel of Christ. Your conduct. What do you think he's talking about when he uses the word conduct? Your actions. Your actions. Okay, so he's not, and, and when they use the word conversation, many times he's not talking about uh, what you say. He's not talking about the dialogue we have one to the other. He's talking more about your actions. He, he's talking more about your lifestyle. He's talking more about how you carry yourself. And what he's doing here is reminding us, this word in the original Greek means uh, citizenship. He's reminding us that we are citizens of heaven. And if you look at some translation, it translates it like that. We are, he says, just one last thing in some translation. He says, just one last thing before I close this chapter out. Just one last thing. Let me remind you. You are a citizen. You are citizens of heaven. And because you are citizens of heaven, I want to remind you, you ought to act like you're citizens of heaven. The problem is, if we're citizens of heaven, many times we don't act like we're citizens of heaven. People can't tell the difference if you're saved or you're unsaved. That's a problem. That's the issue. He says, carry yourself, make your actions line up with the gospel of Christ. Your actions, what you say, how you say it, what you do, your lifestyle ought to be that lifestyle that lines up with Jesus Christ and what he would have you do, the gospel of Christ. I like number 29, too. Wait till I get there. I'm on 27 now. I'm on 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let me hurry up and get to 29. So that whether I come and see you or absent or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand steadfast. Boy, J.R., you're trying to make me miss a whole pericope to get to verse 29. I don't blame you. Come and see you or not. If I'm absent or not, I want to hear of your affairs. I want to hear of your great deeds. I want to hear of your lifestyle. What is he talking about when he says conversation, lifestyle? What is he talking about when he say your life, your lifestyle? What is he talking about your lifestyle? We use that word a lot in the 21st century, your lifestyle will line up with the word. That your whole being should line up with the word of God, the way you live, the way you act, with the things you do. It ought to line up. Does that mean that I'm not going to ever go off on somebody? No, it doesn't. Boy, y'all glad to hear that. I let you off the hook, didn't I? Okay, just keep him buried. Don't let the old nature rise up. Just keep him down. So he, Paul says, it ought to be a part of your DNA, a part of your lifestyle. You ought to be one that, that they can point to you and say, he's living by the gospel of Jesus Christ. She loves the Lord. How can you tell? Because of her lifestyle. They should not ask you, are you a Christian on your job? They may say stuff like, hmm, there's something different about you. And that door just flew wide open. So it's like, when that door, what, why do I say that door flew wide open? There's a chance to witness. There's a chance for you to share Christ. There's something different about you. Don't get on the elevator and look up against the wall and count the numbers as it goes from one foot to the other. Your lifestyle, even your conversation. You got 30 seconds to introduce Jesus Christ. Just start talking. They listening anyway. First, get on there and speak. Say good morning. If they say good morning back, oh, you got it now. Why y'all shaking on here? Why, why you say what, what's the problem here? All I need you to say is good morning back. Because I think. 
We miss opportunities. We got to share Christ. And when we share Christ, Christ is glorified, lives are turned around, people are saved. And the angels in heaven rejoice. And the angels rejoice. Boy, you studied two lessons. So, Paul says, I want to hear about your affairs. And these are the things I want to hear. First of all, I want to hear that you stand steadfast for Jesus Christ. I want to hear that regardless of what other people are doing, other people are saying, regardless of what the climate is, you are standing for Jesus Christ. Regardless of what the climate is. We got a tough climate right now. <laughs> Paul says to Timothy, and Timothy, Paul says, there are some perilous times coming. Men would be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There are some, there are some perilous times coming. And guess what? They're here. There are perilous times, right? There are perilous times. People... People will walk up and, and shoot a person in the head for no reason. Why did you do that? I just wanted to do it. People will take on initiation just to kill a person to prove that they are a good gang member. And it's usually those members who are gang in, a gang, in gangs that are the biggest crybabies. Because they can't function without their gang. That's why I hate to hear pastors say, I got my gang here tonight. You don't have to say amen if you want to. Well, we ought not have a gang. We ought to have believers in Jesus Christ. We ought to have saints of God. Our lifestyle ought to dictate, and our affairs ought to be such affairs that we will stand fast regardless of what the climate looks. We will stand for righteousness and godliness regardless of whether our family members are involved in ungodliness or not. See, some, some preachers can stand and they can preach the gospel as long as it doesn't affect their family. But when their family is caught up in stuff, then they can't preach against it. Paul says, you need to be able to stand fast regardless of the climate. Regardless of who you're related to. Your belief should not be questioned or changed by you because it's your family. So it's not long because Ashley does it, it should not change what you believe in Jesus Christ. You should be able to stand fast and say, Ashley, you're wrong, and you ain't going to do it here. You can say, Oh, that's just my baby. She's just going through something right now. Sister Richard, you ought to be able to tell your children, no, that ain't happening here no more. No, you can't do it here. You know, you know, I've never had to say to any of my family members or any, any of my, my visitors to my house, we can't drink in here. I've never had to say that. I've never had to say you can't smoke in here. I never had to say you can't cuss in here. Why? Why have I never had to say that? Even the grown-ups, I never had to say you can't do that here. Because of your lifestyle. Got it. My lifestyle ought to dictate what can and cannot be done. I ought to be standing fast on what I believe. Paul says to the church at Philippi that I want to hear a great report of your, your affairs the first thing I want to hear, that you stand fair in one spirit. It's a messed up church that has several spirits. That's why when the vision starts from the past, it ought to trickle down and the vision should not change. It ought to be one spirit. We ought not be confused whether we're going to sprinkle or baptize. There ought not be any confused. Anybody confused tonight? It ought not be any confusion over whether we believe that Jesus actually died and rose again. Anybody confused tonight? 
there ought not be a confusion whether we're going to start at 1030, whether we get out at 12 or not. One of my seminary professors has on his, I went to preach for him one year, and, and he had on his sign outside on the marquee, service time, 1108. I said, Brother Pastor, I know you can do what you want to do, but why you got 1108 when most folks usually start at, at 8 o'clock? Uh, at 11 o'clock. He said, well, we used to start at 11 o'clock too. But as I sit in my office, I noticed the deacons didn't start the, the, uh, the devotion until 11.08. So I called the man that put the sign out there and told him to change the sign to 11.08. Well, let me tell you our secret. That ain't going to happen at the New Beginning Church. If we start at 10.30, guess what time? Guide me, oh, thou great Jehovah, if I had to come out the back and sing it myself. We're supposed to start at 10.30, right? That's why you see the choir and the musicians sitting in the, in the choir stand uh, way before, five, ten minutes before, and they're just playing a little soft music. we waiting on 10.30 because 10.30 shouldn't have to wait on us. We ought to have one spirit. Amen. One spirit. Paul says, I want to hear about your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and with one mind. We got to have one mind. We ought to have one focus. We as a church ought to have the mind of reaching souls for Christ. We ought to have the mind of reaching souls. Doesn't matter what happens, we ought to have the mind of reaching souls for Christ. We ought to have the mind of coming to church. How many of y'all wanted to call me today to see if we're going to have church tonight? Didn't even think about it, did you? So it's not a lot of words you think. Come hell or high water, he's going to be there. That's what you thought, Sister Nella? I knew that. You knew that? How did you know that? Because that's your character. That's your lifestyle. Now, my lifestyle, it says one mind, right? So if it's my lifestyle, it's my character, if I think that way, how many more of you think that way? We ought to have one mind, Paul said. And we must be striving together. We must strive together for the faith of the gospel. Another phrase that Paul uses here in another text is he says that we ought to contend for the faith. We ought to fight for the faith. We ought to struggle through the faith. Too many people are wimps when it comes to the gospel. We ought to be really willing to strive for some things. We ought to be willing to, to, to sacrifice for some things when it comes to our Lord. We, we got crises that you have to wonder, really? Is that an excuse that'll do for you? So I've gotten to the point now where I ask the question, well, is that excuse good enough for God? If it's good enough for God and you can stand and look at me and tell me it's good enough excuse for God, then surely it's good enough for me. But I had some people tell me, no, it's not good enough for God. Well, why are you trying to put it on me? Why are you trying to make me go for it if God won't go for it? We ought to be of one mind. We ought to be thriving together, striving together in the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought to strive together. Peter says that we ought to be ready to give a defense of what we believe. Peter says that we ought to have a ready defense. We ought to be ready to give an answer to every person who asks the question of what we believe in Jesus Christ. It's called apologetics. Apologetics. We ought to become apologists. Not meaning that you're going to apologize for things. The phrase apologetics means that you ought to defend the faith. You ought to be ready to give an answer. Now you don't have to argue with people. You don't have to you don't have to start a fight with people. You don't have to holler and scream with people. But you ought to be ready when your door is open. What you believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
that he died for my sins. He rose early that third day morning. I believe that if I trust in him, he will take me to heaven. If I believe that this story, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, if I believe this story, I can get to heaven when I die. That's what I believe. I believe in the word of God. I believe the word of God is infallible, meaning that it is truth. There is no error in it. I believe in the word of God. I believe that God is in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Spirit. I believe that. I may not be able to explain it, you may not be able to explain it, but I believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, operating in three different offices. One God. And ice, water, and steam cannot explain it. The closest we can get is maybe ice, water, and steam, where we say that it's still water, whether it's in liquid form, steam form, vapor, or if it's in a solid form, ice. Close we can get to it, right? But even that cannot explain the triune God. Yes? I believe, I believe that, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And we have to be ready to give an answer of what we, we believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 28, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, 28. Paul says, and not in any way terrified of the adversaries, which is to them proof of prediction. Let me stop here at the adversaries. To not be terrified. To not be terrified. There are people that are so terrified of little bitty offenses. Little bitty things. The other night, the other night, uh, uh, Vice President Joe Biden was up speaking, and there were some people in the audience that had Biden signs, and they used that sign as a camouflage just to get close to the stage. And once they got close to the stage, they start bombarding him, his wife, and his sister, and they made a racket, and they ushered them off the stage real quickly. Boy, his sister couldn't take it the rest of the night. <laughs> she, I mean, she, she, she became secret service that night. <laughs> and, and Joe Biden's wife was saying, it's going to be all right, baby. Just, just calm down. You want me to come over there and hold your hand? <laughs> she was so terrified. See, because she's never been on a, a national scene like that where they just be bitter to you. We live in a dark, dismal terrifying world. Paul says, as you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not let it make you afraid. There are going to be some things that scare you. Man, that was, and you know when he was speaking today, or last night he was speaking, only he and his wife was on the stage. <laughs> he said, I want to thank my sister. She was out there, and my brother-in-law, that tells me that she was out in the audience with, and she was hoping he didn't point her out. She, she brought her husband that night. She brought her shield that night. She was terrified. Brother Miles, she couldn't take it, brother. She, she couldn't take it. She was like, ooh, I don't know if I want to be on this campaign trail. This is a, a dangerous trail. Paul says to us as Christians, whatever you do, live your life for the Lord and don't let the opposition intimidate you. The devil is seeking to intimidate us. The devil wants to give us all kinds of excuses. You know, a lot of people got excuses that they, they can't come to church right now because of COVID-19, right? You have a bigger opportunity to catch any kind of virus in a restaurant, among all kinds of people from all different walks of life, in Sam's, Kroger's, in department stores, than you do at the New Beginning Church. Because if I ask the question right now, how many of you have been to Egypt lately? How many of you have been to Italy lately? How many of you have traveled the seas lately? 
How many of you have been on foreign missions lately? How many of you have been around somebody from any of those categories? So church may be the safest place for you to be there. It may just be the safest place for you to be. There are churches that are, that are counseling churches, counseling church. And it, and it may be the safest place for you to be. Especially at our church where everybody knows everybody. And one thing we know about everybody, at this church, very few of us going overseas. And very few, now see, see, this is a, this is a, this is a typical missionary Baptist church. We use the name missionary Baptist, but very few go on missions. <laughs> You got a better chance of being safe here than you are out there with everybody breathing on you. First thing is, oh, I got that. At, you ain't getting nothing at church. You brought it to the church. Say, don't, don't let this stuff terrify you. Don't let things terrify you when you can't function. There are some people that just can't function right now. I mean, they just can't, they can't function at all. God challenged me the other day. Pastor David, we're going to keep hugging? Well, we, we'll, we'll let the people decide who they want to hug. No, it's your call, man. Your call. And the same guy that won't come to church because of um, COVID-19, he going to the grocery store. He's going to Sam. I mean, people pushing. I mean, when you look at the shelves and they're empty like that, that tells me that a whole heap of people from all walks of life been in there. And they got this security blanket called hand sanitizer. There's no security at all. No. Your security need to be in Jesus. And in Jesus alone. Yeah, we ought to take, we ought to take time. You should have been washing your hands before this came out. Like I told you Sunday, I see guys go to the restroom. They do number one and number two and just walk right past the sink. And I'm using my foot. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> better, better not be anybody on the other side. <laughs> Boom. And I don't want to leave my feet up there on that door too long. <laughs> but that didn't just start happening. That's been the case. And I just say under my breath, you nasty rascal, you. Hell, you know, I mean, they should not have to come on the news every single day, 12 hours a day, 12 hours at night, to tell you to wash your hands. And this thing about coughing, <coughs> now you just contaminated your clothing, yourself, and everybody that you do your elbow bump with. The same elbow that you just coughed in, you're bumping on folks with. I ain't seen nothing like this since the break dance. Stop being so terrified with everything. God is faithful. Paul says, if I die, I'm with the Lord. If I live, I'm going to live in the Lord. And when I leave here, I'm going to be in the Lord's presence. And while I'm here, I understand that there are going to be some struggles. See, what they tell you is how many people who have died, but they don't tell you how many have been cured from it. Are you with me? Let's be realistic. There's a treatment. Just like there's a treatment for our soul. The Bible says the bomb in Gilead that makes the wounded well. Oh, this is not something. I better not get started on that. He is the bomb in Gilead that makes the wounded well. Get your spirit man right. Don't be terrified. Don't, don't, don't get too in tune to what is said before you. Don't be terrified. Paul says, this by them trying to terrify you, that proves that they know that their destruction is on the way. Look, he says, this is proof of prediction. Predi prediction. 
So he said to us that this is proof that they looking and they're going to see their own destruction, their own demise. Those who don't walk with Christ, they already know they have a, a day of reckoning. And because they're trying to terrify you, because they're trying to intimidate you, Paul says this is proof of their destruction. There is a bomb in Gilead. But to you of salvation, this is also proof of your salvation. See, see, we don't walk for Christ in order to be saved. We walk for Christ because we're saved. We don't struggle in this suffering for Christ in order to be saved. We struggle in this suffering for Christ because we're saved. This word salvation means deliverance. This word, the word salvation means that God has, has truly put us in safety for now. That's why you can't be saved one day and unsaved the next. It is eternal security. He has secured us from now on. That's good news, I tell you. It's good news to know that once we are saved, God has secured us from now on. He secured us from that day to the day of redemption. He has secured us. And then he says, and that from God, meaning and God did it. <laughs> I'm telling you, God did it. What I have, God did it. What I don't have, God did it. Because what I don't have is for my betterment. God did it. Don't get excited about cars and houses and money and new babies. Don't get excited about that. Just understand that your spiritual walk in Christ is more important than any of those things. Whatever you have, God gave it to you. Whatever you don't have, God is, is, God is looking out for you and for your good. Paul says in Romans 8 and 28 that we know and we know, for we know, that all things work together for the good to them that are called according to his purpose and to them who love him. That's why Paul says rejoice. Rejoice in, in your good times. Rejoice in your bad times. Just, just have fun with it. I spent my time on life support. The moment somebody walked in my room and said, how you doing? Oh, I'm excellent. Excellent. Man, but you got tubes and bars and wires and all this stuff. And you got stuff protruding out of here. Got one protruding out of here. Piece of metal coming out of here. Blood flowing through the tube. We see the blood flowing through. We see all that stuff flowing out. We got You got wires up your nose, wires on your head. You just came out and what did you say? I said excellent. It was a pitiful sight. I saw the pictures. I'm excellent. Too many folk worry about little bitty stuff that they just fall out over. When I say life support, I mean just, just a heartbeat from death. And God gave me another chance. And as the old folk back home would say, I'm going to serve in the balance of my day. But young people, you don't have to, to wait till it get to that point. You got to live for it. Paul says God did. Verse 29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for his sake. Verse 30 having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear in me. Paul, Paul says, even though God has blessed us and he's the God of many blessings, he's still the same God through suffering. <laughs> he, he, he's the same God that blessed us to come through our good times and he's the same God as we go through our suffering times. He's the same God. Paul says to us that it is good for us to suffer through Christ's sake. Matter of fact, as you suffer, count it all joy. It's pretty hard to count it joy, though, isn't it? When you're going through it, it's like, God, are you still there? 
God, haven't you heard me hollering and screaming and crying and slaying his snot? Haven't you seen me, Lord? God, are you going to answer me? Are you going to answer me the way I'm going to answer? I want you to answer. Job tried it. Elijah tried it. Why not us? Job was like, God, I, I cursed the day I was born. He said, Job, where were you? <laughs> the Bible said the, 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 the clouds roll back and God starts speaking to Job. Ask him a, a, some rhetorical questions. <laughs> and go, Job had to crawl back in his little humble shell and said, for God I live and for God I die. Don't, don't he slay me yet will I trust. <laughs> Elijah tried it. And he had, he had done a great miracle on Mount Carmel. He defeated over 850 prophets of the grove and of Baal. And he had defeated these prophets on Mount Carmel. And then he let a woman put him on the run. Then he will tell God. God, I'm the only one standing for you. God said, I got thousands who have not bowed to Baal. You see, the devil wants us to believe that we're the only one going through what we're going through. That's why we need a support system. The devil wants us to think that nobody, oh, what would me? mean? The devil wants you to throw the biggest pity party you can throw. God said, I got a bunch of them. I got thousands of them that has not bowed to the idol God be. He says, I got thousands of people who've gone through what you're going through. You just got to connect with them. And hear their testimony and watch what God is doing in their lives. This old husband, you have given me God you I thought he was going to be like this. God said, there's plenty of women that got men that, that are drunkards. That can't lead and won't lead. That won't bring their paychecks home. But these women have been strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. And that's what I've been able to keep them. There are many men who have decided that they're going to live for the Lord and their wives have decided they're going to live for the devil. You ain't the only one. Boy, y'all see how y'all looking at me. You're not the only one that's going through. Paul says, don't let these things terrify you. Just know that you're going to have to go through some suffering. Everything ain't going to line up every time. But God is with me. And he's more than all that can be against you. And when God is with me, I'd rather he be with me than my best friend be with me. Because when God is with me, I know he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'd rather have God than to, than to have what I've been asking God for. I'd rather have favor than to have what I've been asking God for. God asked Solomon, what, what do you want? What, what, just tell me what you want, and I'll grant it to you. Solomon said, just, just give me wisdom, how to go in and out before your people. And guess what? He gave him all the money he could ever pay. Isn't that something? God knows what we needed and need and when we need it. We just have to submit, even through the suffering. Doctors say, oh, he's not going to make it through the night. Oh, she's not going to make it through the night. God has the last word. You keep trusting God. Paul says, you've seen what I've gone through. You have examined what I've gone through. Now, I'm telling you, you're going to have some suffering to go through, too. But whatever you do, keep trusting in the Lord. He says, having the same conflict which you saw in me is now 
the same conflict that you hear of me and hear in me. And guess what? You have the same conflict. Anybody been pulled over for driving while black? Walking while black? Followed while black? Light shining in your face while black? Biggest crime on the map now. In the wrong neighborhood, you can't be living in this neighborhood. You gotta follow me all the way home. I pulled into the neighborhood, he was coming out of the neighborhood, he, he got right next to me and shined his light across the car in my face. I just kept going. He made a U-turn, turn around, followed me all the way to my house. Sit in front of my house. Just sit there. I'm getting my stuff out. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Coming in from out of town. I'm getting my stuff out. He just sit there. After a while, I guess he figured a black guy could live. He'd have to <laughs> <laughs> so the bottom line is we're going to suffer through some things we're going to go through some things Paul says count it joy Paul says don't be afraid don't be terrified watch what God does and God will do it with you yes, alright everybody your homework uh, for next week next few weeks is what Philippians chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. You are to make notes from those chapters and pick out some nuggets there. And don't leave me hanging out there by myself, all right? We're looking at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 4. And you're going to find out sooner or later, you're going to realize that when you say, for all things work together for the good, that all things really work together for the good. And then when you get to Philippians 4 and 13, what does that say? And we know, for we know. No. Philippians chapter 4 and 13. For I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. You're going to understand that it's not talking about what you've been talking talk about all your life. The reason why he says in Philippians 4 and 13 is not the reason why you've been thinking all your life. But you got to study. Amen. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for another privilege and honor to hear your word. We ask you to bless your word that your word will fall on this soil. Bless us, Father God, as we go forth, that we will tell others of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Let me thank those who joined us by Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiremai Road. We're glad that you've joined us. Please feel free to come and join us again. We're so glad that you have been a blessing to our ministry. If you want to continue to be a blessing, you can do so financially by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Join us on Wednesday night at 720 and on Sunday morning you can join us live at 11 o'clock or you can visit us at 1030 service on Sunday morning. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Well, we thank